Uh, kia ora, good evening, Central Hawks Bay. I think hopefully if uh, my technical skills have been successful, we might be live on Facebook now. I'm just going to check to make sure. And looks like, yes, there we are. Uh, we are live um, on Facebook this evening and we're actually a couple of minutes early just to make sure that we could uh, get organised. Um, but welcome Deputy Mayor Kelly who has joined me this evening um, and we're following up uh, a council initiative where the team published on Thursday last week into the CHB Mail um, they published a really cool a summary document talking about the work that had been happening uh, across our wastewater infrastructure over the last three years, a, a checking in on what it is that we had been progressing towards and the work that had been delivered. And uh, it's really interesting because infrastructure investment is more than three quarters of the work that we do, of the investments that we make and of the rates that we charge into the community. And um, it's something that is, uh, you know, a huge part of everything we do uh, and is the way that council has its biggest leverage into helping Central Hawke's Bay thrive and be successful. But we don't always talk about it. Um, we don't always show the in-depth work that is happening um, across the, the um, infrastructure networks, unless you can see it. You know, we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years um, focused on roads because we could see it, you know, pot, pothole um, sagas. And then, of course, the very obvious damage from uh, both Cyclone Gabrielle and um, in 2022, uh, the wettest year that we'd had on record, which saw um, pretty obvious damage to our roads. And so we see those things. Um, it means that we talk about those things. We don't always talk about um, everything else across our infrastructure portfolio that's really important. And um, as the, your elected councillors, representatives um, on council, we spend a lot of time in this space, um, a lot of time working on the strategy of what it is that we do, um, but then also the monitoring of what does that delivery look like. So Kelly and I are on here tonight, uh, we can take some live questions about the work that's been happening um, across wastewater uh, if you like to share questions with us um, but we thought what we might do is uh, kind of go back to the beginning a little bit and talk about um, where the focus in our wastewater our sewer the poo ponds all of those whatever you want to call it um, <laughs> what that has been like over the last few years and uh, and the work that's been done and I'm actually going to start um, back in 2000 and uh, end of 2016 actually because I actually hadn't been the mayor very long like ma a matter of a few weeks when the Hawke's Bay Regional Council uh, actually put an enforcement notice on us and we ended up in environment court proceedings for wastewater treatment plants that were non-compliant um, and so this is a story um, hashtag the big wastewater story uh, it's a big um, story that we've been part of and working on for quite some time um, and has culminated in uh, two and a half years ago when we adopted our last long-term plan culminated in us putting a pretty large plan to the community about what it would mean to get our wastewater treatment into a space that was fit for the future that could deal with growth, that could reduce our environmental footprint and could just be better sized um, for what it is that Central Hawke's Bay needs. Um, and that's where the Big Water Story strategy um, came to life. It's pretty big, um, pretty daunting, but we've been making some progress on it. And kind of some key um, principles behind it. The first one being that we've got six wastewater treatment plants um, across the whole district and for a connected, about four and a half thousand households that are connected uh, across the district, our six wastewater plants is a huge investment uh, to build, to maintain and to run. It's too many. Uh, we need to rationalise to be better sized for our community. Uh, and so that was part of the plan. We were going to, we're, we're working towards getting from six down to three. And uh, the other fundamental principle in there was that uh, all water in Central Hawke's Bay is really valuable and we need to be really clever and smart about how we value it and how we use it uh, and what we do with it. And so the impact of 
the nutrient that's still in the treated wastewater that goes currently into our rivers. Uh, we had to change that. We had to value how we were using that water. Um, and it made sense for it not to be going back into the rivers, but in a way that we could treat it to an even better standard um, and use it on land. And that was a pretty big strategy at the time. And um, we started our work towards that. And we've made some really great gains. And Kelly and I will uh, cut, we'll talk about some of those um, tonight. And in fact, what was shared in the CHB mail on Thursday went uh, across seven key um, milestones that have happened in the last few years to talk to, to, to give you a sense of what investment in wastewater has looked like for us and what we've been able to achieve. Uh, so I think that cuts, that gives us kind of sets the scene. Kelly, if you want to add anything else or maybe get into the first part of uh, what we've delivered. Yeah, I'll just get straight into it, I think, Alex. I mean, the, the first exciting uh, project that we did get into was um, taking the Otani uh, wastewater and pumping it to Waikawa. Um, this was a really exciting day and project for all of us at Council. It meant um, not only were we um, being more efficient with um, our wastewater treatment and uh, putting it into Waipawa, but also um, it meant that the Papa Nui basement Basin was no longer receiving um, treated wastewater, which was um, one of our really important environmental goals for the Otani area, and we were super proud of that. I think it's interesting what's flowed on from there, Kelly, is that the Papua Nui subcatchment um, was a, a priority subcatchment um, for the regional council um, in the Tuki Tuki catchment plan and um, was heading towards having a high enough nutrient in the catchment that it was going to trigger for all landowners and all um, people that, um, that uh, leach any nutrient into that catchment were going to need to move into a consent process um, to farm in those areas. And actually what's happened in the last year or two is that the nutrient load in that catchment has um, backed off and actually um, those farmers and, and landowners haven't tipped into that. So, you know, collectively, not just council, but actually all of the landowners in that catchment have had uh, an impact and um, have started to reduce the environmental um, uh, degradation that's been happening there. So we were kind of one part, the wastewater was one part of the contribution to that issue and uh, we've managed to remove that. So we're part of a bigger picture on that one. The second one is, um, is that in bringing together Waipokoro and Waipawa um, wastewater treatment, the, those are the two biggest plants where we have um, issues in the ability to treat the nutrient that comes out of wastewater. Uh, and it's gonna take us a long time. It was a 15 year program for us to get right through to going from seven plants down to three and to be able to build a, what we called a mega plant um, at Waipawa that would receive all of the wastewater from Waipokoro, Waipawa and Otani. Um, but in the meantime, we had to do some more work to uh, get to improve the treatment there. So that the water could be ready to be used. And um, two really big things have happened um, in that space. And the first one was uh, the very large amount of sludge that was taken out of both ponds. And uh, that seems like a um, really obvious thing to do. It's actually quite a complicated process uh, to do, took quite a significant investment. Um, in fact, it cost uh, 2.3 million dollars uh, to do the desludging across both Waipokoro and Waipawa. Quite a significant um, project. Then you've also got to deal with what do you do with that sludge and what that, that is used for. Um, we came up with a pretty cunning plan which was actually that sludge was taken to the landfill where it was not just dumped in the landfill but it was really cleverly used uh, to help cap a cell that had been completed that then actually is regrassed and um, is used to cover the top of where the landfill is completed um, rather than just becoming a waste substance. And so that was a really that was a really big win. That was the sludge. And um, the other part of improvements to the plants was a um, particular engineering improvement called a DAF, a DAF, a dissolved <laughs> air flotation device, <laughs> uh, which has increased the ability for the Waipawa wastewater treatment plant. Uh, to process uh, nutrient in that water and particularly 
ammonia, which is what contributes nitrogen into the river. Um, and so that has seen pretty incredible uh, increase to the ability to treat there. Um, both of those plants, though, uh, have seen damage from being flooded from the cyclone. Uh, so everything's patched up and treatment back up underway, um, but uh, we continue to see how that's optimised um, as we continue to do go through recovery from the cyclone. But massive wind there to have improved treatment, both in Waipokoro and Waipawa, from first of all desludging and second of all um, the installation of the DAF unit uh, in Waipawa that had a really big impact. Yeah, and number five is another personal favourite of mine because um, it was our first attempt at actually ensuring that our wastewater was going to land and it was the Takapo wastewater system upgrade um, that has been halted a little bit um, due to cyclone and uh, we do have a consent for that but there's quite a bit of stuff that needs to be worked through um, as we navigate the next year um, as to how that's going to happen but that's a really exciting project that we've actually really advanced that to be able to ensure that we can get that wastewater actually being uh, used as a way to irrigate onto land rather than going into our waste into our water systems, um, and uh, that was always always going to be the really exci another exciting project because of the fact that we could actually start to really start to um, I guess do our dreams of of taking our wastewater out of our rivers. So. Um, yeah, but still, it goes into the not completed. It's still in the progress and, and needs to still be advanced, uh, but certainly something that we continue to be committed to over the next few years. Yeah, so there's, we've actually got a resource consent to do that uh, change of discharge to go to land. That was a pretty big milestone um, for us. It's the type, it's a type of wastewater processing which has actually never been consented anywhere else in Hawke's Bay before, so it was a new thing for the region. Um, and we, alongside Mana Whenua and interested community members, have actually covered quite a bit of ground. We'd been to um, fielding across Manawatu, we'd been down to Sanson, uh, we'd been out to Foxton Beach, we'd seen other places that were using these styles of um, irrigation treatment, um, ir irrigation spreading of water from wastewater treatment uh, to inform this. And it was a pretty big milestone, not just for us, but actually the, the whole Hawke's Bay region to get consent for that. And as Kelly said, implementation a bit trickier uh, now that we're just dealing with some of the effects of the cyclone. Um, the next the next milestone uh, in that big package of wastewater works uh, has been, um, we haven't completed the consent yet, but the consent is in process out in Port Angaho. And uh, for those that don't know, uh, out there there's actually currently two pond systems. There's one next to the village. Um, and there is one uh, next to the beach settlement, um, just behind the sand dunes of Te Paerahi. Uh, and so the plan there was to consolidate to one treatment space, um, and then instead of treated wastewater going onto the sand dunes um, on some, uh, some Māori-owned land that is there, is to take that away from that sensitive sand dune area and um, away from the river system. And so that consent is in process. We've done a lot of work with our Rongo Marae or Marae and Ngāti Kiri Hapu out there. Um, there was also the opportunity um, with this where we got some funding to help us connect um, the system across to the Marae. Uh, and so that consent is uh, in process. That's also been a really big piece of work that has been undertaken in the last couple of years. Um, we are going to see that start to change now also with the impacts of the cyclone. Um, uh, but uh, a really uh, important project out there um, in that community and we've made pretty significant inroads there too. Absolutely and I think the important thing to focus on there Alex is, is that these are things that are still in play um, and it is they are projects that are going to be rolled out over the next six to ten years so these um, the, a lot of these projects are huge projects they're not things that are going to happen overnight but the exciting thing is is that if um, you 
if you have a plan in place and you stick to it um, and you navigate the things that sort of come and, and sort of stop you sometimes on your tracks and rephase things, um, as the strategy is still the strategy, we're still wanting to progress this work, um, but it's, it, is gonna, it is the long game in most of these big infrastructure projects. And I think that's the thing that is sometimes hard to understand as a community member. <clears throat> a lot of money is outlaid, a lot of uh, hopes and dreams are said, and we've said that we're gonna do different things but often when we're talking about things, we're talking about sometimes a 10 to 20, sometimes 30 year plan, especially in the growth field. So we're doing things a lot of the time, not just for us, but so that our children and ch our children's children have the benefit of it. Um, and that's just the way it goes when you're doing community planning. The yeah, it really is, it is long term, yes. really long term investment. And that's also comes down to how we fund for it as well. So um, a lot of this is being um, is being debt funded, and what that means is that we, as the contributing ratepayers now, are contributing to the improvements that we see now. But actually, then future ratepayers and future generations who continue to see the benefit of it are also um, part of um, the group that are contributing to it too. So it's not just us paying directly rates now for it, but it's actually how that progresses out over the future um, rate paying generations. Yeah, you're right. So the seventh project is info and infiltration investigations. And I remember years ago when we bought our first house, I got a letter from council to say that um, they had blown smoke up our pipe and that basically we needed to uh, to fix our uh, stormwater and being not connected to the right place. And so that's part of uh, one of the long-term projects as well around actually improving the performance of our wastewater treatment plants is to make sure that those uh, connected properties that their stormwater is connected in the right way, that it's not um, going into our wastewater treatment plant and, and I guess um, I guess causing uh, added flooding uh, so that untreated sewage would go into the river. So that is a really important project. Um, but it's also, once again, it's not an easy project. So you're talking about um, lots and lots of individual properties. Um, across the district and also uh, when it comes to properties you're talking about people and individuals as well so um, this is something that we are certainly working on to be able to improve the performance of, of our wastewater treatment plants over the next few years. It's also really connected to um, not just where our wastewater networks are connected to individual properties, but then also um, how the rest of our network performs. And so some of you might remember when we did um, our last long-term plan, which was in 2021, uh, we talked about the state of our piping network. And at the time, 25% of our drinking water network and 40% of our wastewater network were in urgent need of replacing. They were old or they were broken and they were in a pretty sorry state. Um, so not just improvements to the treatment infrastructure, but actually the renewals of those pipes, um, which had been left in many instances far too long. Um, and you think about how old the townships of Waipawa and Waipokoro are, uh, to think that there are pipes in that network that are, uh, you know, approaching 100 years old, and sometimes they're a bit older. And so there's been a huge amount of work um, in relining pipes, um, fixing pipes, and in fact, the renewals investment has seen just under six kilometres of wastewater pipe uh, renewed uh, around the district. Um, really big bit has been uh, in Waipokoro. And in, in addition to that, nearly six kilometres has been the addition of nine kilometres of pipe, um, which is what has connected Otani back to Waipawa. Um, so quite a lot in that pipe work. And uh, to have seen that level of renewal of pipes um, and protecting of other pipes that were needed to be relined on the inside um, has been undertaken in the last two years as well. Uh, so that's quite a significant um, step change where renewal was not really happening um, of any length, any stretch of pipe before that. Um, this was the first time in a long time that there had been dedicated investment in doing that. What that means is that across all of these things, um, in the last three years, uh, we've spent um, over $14 million um, on wastewater treatment improvements and pipe renewals. We've we've all, we've had for quite a number of years now a really dedicated focus on how do we bring external funding in to help us do that. So it's not just us, not just us now as the existing ratepayers, and also 
um, not just sitting on future ratepayers either, but what does additional investment look like in there? Um, so tourism infrastructure funding around growth at the coastal area, for instance, is helping us um, with our Port Onga wastewater work. Um, during the time of the last government's three waters reform, there was um, uh, there was stimulus funding put in just post COVID that uh, paid for quite a large proportion of the the nine kilometres of new pipe uh, to connect to Ortani. Um, about two thirds was paid for by us, and one third was from um, external funding. And so that's also been a real success story for us. It doesn't take away all of the pain, doesn't take away any of the work, um, but it certainly it certainly helps. And um, we've been pretty proud of how we've managed to do that. It's not been easy um, and it's not been something that previous councils have actually been terribly successful at. Um, but we've we've been able to bring in quite significant amounts of funding, which has been um, a real plus. What have we missed, Kelly? Have we got any questions? No, I don't think we have so far. Not that I can see anyway. Nobody wants to talk to us about <laughs> the coupons. No, I don't think we have so far. Not that I can see anyway. Nobody wants to talk about So I think the, the other important thing um, that that we can just cover off when it comes to wastewater is that um, this is going to have a big impact on how we go into our next three-year plan that we're working on currently um, and what we choose to do next. So we're, we've been on a path um, of improvements uh, to treatment and pretty significant investment. Um, over the next three years, as we traverse how we get out of the um, impacts of Cyclone Gabrielle, that's going to look different. Um, we've got a council meeting coming up on Thursday where we are considering um, what our infrastructure strategy is going to look like uh, in that. Um, an important bit of context um, for us with our wastewater treatment is that um, four of our six, um, four of our five remaining plants all had some um, fairly significant level of flooding or damage uh, to them um, from the cyclone, and not just the direct damage to them, but then where flooding and impacts have happened around it. Uh, so, for instance, in Porongaho, where the village is uh, still in Category 2A, so uncertain about how future flood risk will be, um, will be dealt with, um, it means that where our treatment is and how that works, and we actually just need to pause for a bit uh, to see what would happen next. Um, because where do the stock banks go? What does that mean to the flood um, patterns? Uh, is that still the right place for us to build um, infrastructure? All of those questions remain. So um, we need to look at an infrastructure strategy for the next three years that takes into account all of that um, and sensibly looks at what can we afford to do, what is practical to do, and uh, how much do, can we pause and wait for further certainty um, to, to come through as well. And even changes to the government, um, which is changing um, potentially some of the national environmental regulations um, around what levels of treatment might need to be done. There's, there's quite a few moving parts um, that we're going to need to consider, and we're considering um, on Thursday, uh, what that looks like before it comes out for community consultation to look at how these um, things fit together and uh, how we think the best way to invest as a community is for the coming three years based on where we've been and the context of the damage from the cyclone. And that's our next steps. So Alex, you touched on there um, and we've got a really good question from Bob around how can we fund these projects now that Three Waters has gone and what is the projected percentage rates increase? Sure. Well, that's a really, really good question, Bob, because um, uh, what we're seeing is a policy position shift with the new government um, about how we get the investment right through Waters infrastructure. Um, and what's been really important to us is that um, the work we've done collectively as Hawke's Bay continues to be the basis of how we move forward. So we had already put our hands up several years ago to say that actually this was broken, us doing it on our own. Quite clearly, we're not going to be able to do everything ourselves and definitely not in the short period that we would like to be able to do it. Um, and so we've been working together with Hawke's Bay. Um, and that's where we continue to focus on how we're going to do that. So what that means 
is that um, the responsibilities for directing and prioritising and, and how to get work done in our three waters assets still happens between the local and the regional level. That's where we're aiming to get to. Um, and so that then we can um, make sure that we're getting the right outcomes for our communities. It's a bit different to what the previous government had put forward, which was, you might remember those really large um, entities um, where we were one of sort of 22 councils, I think it was, in the first version. And then the second version, it came down to being Hawke's Bay and Tairawhiti together. Um, this is now uh, focused on how we do it as the Hawke's Bay region and continue to look at that. What we know is that investment um, across Three Waters infrastructure is still going to need to increase. Um, even how the reform was, it was always going to be paid for by charges or rates that would come from the connected property. Um, and we know that that's going to need to continue to go up. But um, us working together with the Hawke's Bay region means we've got a bigger pool of people who are connected um, which gives us um, more scope to be able to fund, um, to be able to potentially borrow and source funds um, from different places, and also to bring um, expertise in closer to Central Hawke's Bay that maybe we can't get on our own, um, that we can um, do if we work together as the Hawke's Bay region. So we're pretty clear that continuing to work on how do we stand up our Hawke's Bay regional entity um, is the next step, and uh, that's what we're focused on. And also, Alex, what is the projected percentage of rates increase for for these projects? Uh, so currently, um, uh, across the board, we're looking at, um, depending on what councillors decide on Thursday, we're looking somewhere between 20 and 24% um, across the whole district in terms of rates increases. Um, but what we're seeing in um, wastewater is that um, there is a, a, a similar kind of number, about 20% increase into that. A lot of that is to do with the interest rates increasing um, and not actually to do with new work going into the next part of the plan. It's about how do we continue to tread water, literally, um, based on the really hyperinflated financial situation that we're all in. So the interest rates that your mortgage is driving your mortgage payments up are also driving the costs um, for council up, uh, as well as insurance and um, basically eroded buying power to be able to do anything. And that's driving um, what that increase is going to look like. And that's all the questions so far, Alex. Well, that's good. Um, we will be, uh, there's actually, the council team are going to do a similar thing to what they did last week. Um, each week for the next few weeks, I think, and I think next this coming week it'll be roading, I think, to talk about um, what investment has happened over the last three years and what does that look like. So we might come back again um, next week to do that one. Um, but as always, we're always welcome questions um, on any of these things. Um, watch out for the council meeting coming up on Thursday. That's a really, really big meeting for us where we're looking at how we decide on what um, our options are moving forward and what the options we want to come and talk to community about to decide um, actually what is the right way to, to, to take the next step now in the context of the cyclone and what we've got to do. So um, uh, keep an eye out for that. You can watch that live stream on Facebook um, and um, it's also you can come into the council chambers at any time to watch our meetings and our workshops and our discussions and where we're learning and doing these things. So I encourage people to do that. And also to search hashtag the big water story, uh, the big wastewater story, sorry, um, on our council website because there's actually heaps of information there too about the work that's been undertaken. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a really good place to find more information. I think that probably yeah. covers it, really, does it? Yeah, I think it really does. Okay, so thank you everyone who's um, been watching along, uh, sharing a question and... Uh, I hope that uh, you learned something a bit about the work that uh, Central Laws Bay District Council has been doing on uh, wastewater for the last three years and uh, look forward to chatting to you another time.